I'm Valerie, and today we're making evil Victorian underthings. Delilah Briarwood in The Legend of Vox Machina is not actually Victorian, but her silhouette, as designed by Phil Barossa for the animated series, has a definite 1890s feel to it. And very specifically, like right in the 1890, 91, 92 range. I'll get into that a little bit more in future videos. But for right now, what that means is if we're going to create a silhouette, we have to start from the inside out. Now, I have perfectly serviceable undergarments for that period. I have chemise, drawers, a couple of different corsets that I could have used. But the standard for a variety of mostly practical reasons for undergarments in the 1890s was white. And somehow I just couldn't see our queen of necromantic elegance swanning around in white unmentionables. So I decided, let's go with black. You kind of got to skirt the line with Delilah. You can't be too plain. You can't be too floofy. She's very elegant. So we kind of play with the how decorated it's going to be in the process. Now I went into this with the assumption that black under things are just not period at all in our world and that I was doing something completely fantasy until the day that Snappy Dragon posted her new chemise that she had just made and opened up to her followers, what are you working on? And I said, well, funny thing, I'm just embarking on some Victorian other things as well, but I'm going with black and I explained why. And she commented back that she had heard that black under things were fashionable in the 1890s. And of course, that's something I'd never heard of, but of course it sent me right down a research rabbit hole that I had not intended to go down at all. I didn't go very far because again, this is not intended to be an actual historical costume. This is Victorian inspired in a completely different fantasy world. But I did manage to find a few extant examples. Now these are all silk, which makes sense because a color fast black dye for cotton, which most of your under things would have been made of in the Victorian era, really wasn't something that they had. I didn't find anything beyond that, but if you happen to catch the research bug and find any more about this possible trend, I assume on the very high society in the 1890s, let me know. And also drop Snappy Dragon a line because I think she's curious about it too. In any case, let's make some evil under things. For the chemise, my base pattern is Butterick 6884, which is unfortunately out of print, but not too hard to find on Etsy or eBay. This time I mostly used it as a template for the neckline and armholes, but set it a couple inches away from the fold to add a little fullness, angled it out to a bit of a trapeze shape, and extended the length to mid-thigh. I'm pretty tall, so a yardstick works for that purpose. Victorian undergarments are typically made from a lightweight cotton. I chose the Cambridge Cotton Lawn from Robert Kaufman Fabrics. There are notes and links in the description for all my materials and research sources. I first cut out the back, then used it as a template for where to add on to the pattern piece for the front. Most antique pieces I've seen in fine fabrics like this, especially undergarments, are finished with French seams, and that's what I did here. Not only do they look very clean and help prevent fraying, they're comfortable against my skin. For a French seam, I started by sewing the seams with wrong sides together, so on this first pass, the chemise is right side out but with the raw edge showing. I trimmed the seam allowance to about 1 of an inch and pressed it to one side. 
Then I turned it and stitched so the raw edges are sealed inside the second line of stitches. If you're not familiar with French seams, this might be a little confusing. I'll put a link in the description to a good tutorial. I don't want to bore you with endless footage of me ironing, but I promise I did press the finished seams before pinning a narrow hem on the neckline and armholes. Always press seams. And hems. I chose a cotton lace trim for the neckline, with holes big enough to thread a narrow ribbon through for the drawstring. It's actually easier for me to line up the bottom edge of the lace with the edge of the neckline without pinning it. I ran two lines of stitching close together for strength. I then added a row of the same lace at the armholes. Then another good press to make everything nice and neat. I found the center front and threaded the ribbon all around the lace at the neckline. My favorite tool for this is a ballpoint bodkin, but a small safety pin or a tapestry needle would also work. This footage shows black ribbon, but I changed it out later for purple. It's polyester ribbon, so I melted the cut ends in a candle flame to keep them from fraying. Once the drawstring was done, I tried it on to confirm the bottom edge was even and hit where I wanted it to. Then I pressed a narrow hem, folded over twice. With the hem already pressed, I could stitch the hem and attach the lace to the bottom edge all in one go to finish the chemise. My pattern for the drawers is Simplicity 1139. It's meant for more of a mid-19th century style, but I'll need to have them put together to decide where to shorten them and add a different style of ruffle at the bottom. So I started by cutting the pieces out without modification. Then it was back to French seam land for the leg seams. It's a little trickier around curves, but the process is the same. I flat felled the seams to join the legs in the front, pressing the seam open and then turning the raw edges under to stitch them down. Since these are historical style open drawers, I hemmed the edges the rest of the way around the back. To gather the top edge, I started by stitching a zigzag across a length of heavy duty thread. When I first heard of this trick, they said to use dental floss, but now I usually use upholstery thread. Next up, I put together the waistband, with the ribbon ties anchored in the side seams. This half drawstring construction is a little tricky, and I ended up doing it a little differently from how the pattern instructions say. After joining the side seams, I stitched the two layers of the waistband together at the top edge. I made a narrow hem at the ends of the waistband before stitching them together, so that the opening for the drawstring doesn't have a raw edge. Turned the waistband right side out and pressed it. Then I closed the ends of the waistband, leaving about a one inch opening for the ties.
To gather the drawers onto the waistband, I divided each piece into sections and pinned those points together. It's much easier to distribute the gathers evenly if I do that first. Then I pulled the gathering thread and pinned some more, adjusting the gathers as I went to make sure they were even. I continued to adjust the distribution of the gathers while stitching the seam. Sometimes I take the pins out as I go, sometimes I prefer to stitch over them. Whichever is better in the moment for keeping the gathers even. Once the seam is done, I can pull out the gathering thread to use again. I threaded the ties through the openings left in the ends of the waistband. That left the raw edge on the inside of the waistband. I turned it under and pinned it, being careful not to catch the ties. They need to move freely inside the casing. Then I stitched it down, again being mindful of where the ties were inside. Once the waistband was finished, I stitched back over the anchor points for the ties to reinforce them. Then another off-screen press and a row of top stitching at the top edge of the waistband to make it look nice and finished and help keep it flat through future washings. With the construction finished, I tried them on and marked where I thought I wanted to cut the legs off. I measured up from the bottom edge of the leg for a couple more marks to make sure I cut straight. After trying them on again, I decided to take off two more inches. I cut the ruffles four inches wide with a length twice the circumference of the ends of the legs. I joined the ends of the ruffles into a loop, again with a French seam. After pressing a narrow hem on one edge of each ruffle, I pinned the lace I had chosen for them at the very edge. Just like with the hem of the chemise, I stitched the hem and attached the lace in one pass. It's not something I can always get away with, but this thin cotton irons very flat and stays put. Turns out I wasn't recording when I gathered the ruffles and attached them to the legs, but the process was the same as on the waistband. Then I cut a two inch strip as binding to finish the seam between the leg and the ruffle and pressed down a quarter inch along the edge. 
I stitched the other edge along the seam line, then turned it and top stitched the pressed edge over the seam allowance. I had a couple different styles of lace to choose from for the band above the ruffle, and I picked the one that I could thread two rows of ribbon through, similar to the museum drawers with the yellow ribbon. I stitched the lace down close to both edges, and once again threaded the ribbon through with my ballpoint bodkin. Two neat bows on each leg, and that finishes the drawers! I decided pretty early on that I didn't want to make a new corset for this project. I just wasn't in the mood. Luckily, I happen to have a body type that makes it easy for me to shop for commercial corsets that fit me pretty well, so I ended up going with this one from Corset Deal. I did buy a lacing hook from Atelier Sylph, which is a reproduction of one from an extant garment. Now the purpose of this hook is to pull the laces down away from the waistline so that you're reducing the bulk. But that's the only thing that I did on this purchased corset. So that's our chemise, drawers, and corset. That's our basic undergarments for any Victorian look. But they're not all that we need to achieve our silhouette and to suggest the shape that Delilah is in the character design. So next time, we're gonna talk about the bustle pad and the petticoat. I hope you'll join me. It'll probably be a couple weeks before I upload that. And until then, bye bye